everybody. Uh, my, my name is Mark Lanza. I'm with the Motion Picture Sound Editors, and welcome to our Sound Advice event for June. Um, actually, June is going to be a busy month. We have three events planned. We've got this one, we've got one in New York, and we've, we're going to have one from London. Uh, the one in London is going to be uh, a Mission Impossible Fallout. Supervising sound editor James Matter is going to be there, as well as his effects editors and uh, music editor. It's June 23rd at 2 p.m. in London. We're going to live stream it, just like we're doing with this one. It's going to be 6 a.m. Uh, L.A. time. But uh, we, we always post our, our shows on Facebook. We stream them live Facebook, post them after, so you can always check it out later. Uh, anyway, I would like to, uh, oh, and by the way, if you're not MPSC members and you're thinking about it, please come talk to me after and I can give you all the details. Uh, we have student membership, professional memberships, all of that. Um, uh, let's see, uh, oh yeah, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, you'll see all of our events and things coming up. We have a lot of stuff, including we're sponsoring a mix for film again this year over Sony Pictures. That's coming up in September. Uh, I would like to thank the Los Angeles Film School for hosting, uh, giving us this venue tonight, supporting the MPSE and the arts, as well as Hunter George and James Barth for helping to, uh, to set up and coordinate this entire event. Um, I would now like to introduce Peter Sullivan. Peter Sullivan is one of the best recordists in the industry today. Uh, he's going to go over many, <laughs> many techniques. He, he's heckling himself. Uh, leave that to me. I can, I can do that. Um, uh, he's going to go over a lot of techniques uh, tonight for recording, as well as situations he's gotten himself into, as well as out of, over his many years uh, recording in the field in many different countries uh, around, around the world. Um, he's uh, rather colorful, and he knows his stuff. Um, so I guarantee you'll learn something tonight, and you're in for more than you were originally bargained for. Um, now, the, uh, I'd like to introduce the one and the only Mr. Peter Michael Sullivan. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And thanks to God that there is only one. <laughs> because that's more than enough. So, like David Byrne opened the Talking Heads concert, I have an effect I want to play. <laughs> Now we're going for the fast and stop. Hopefully there won't be any mic movement this time. Here in this room, owe a great debt of gratitude to the Greek poet Aeschylus. He was a Greek poet, playwright, and soldier in the Peloponnesian War back around 550 BC. And he was the man who changed Greek theater in that he took the emphasis away from the chorus interacting with the actors. It was basically a chorus driven art form until Aeschylus said, let's try something different. Let's make the characters drive the story. And he gave us the character driven narrative we have today. And regarding this particular recording, and others that I don't have, because this isn't about a resume of my suffering, but he wrote something very pertinent back around 550 BC. He wrote the following poem. He who learns must suffer, and even in our sleep, pain that cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart. When in our own despair and against our will comes wisdom to us by the awful grace of God. This coming from a pagan. So, this was uh, long before any of monotheism really reached into that part of the world. But he was right. 
And that brings up something I want to talk about, and that is that, especially if you have in mind to go around the world, as I so naively did in 1989 after finishing working on The Abyss, I had never even been to Canada. And I decided, well, what the heck, let's take six months and circumnavigate the Northern Hemisphere. So I learned many valuable lessons there and got many bruises and injuries. So a sunken boat, gun to the head, shot at, teetering on the edge of a roof, dealing with the Muslim Brotherhood, waving a two by four with nails at me. Did I mention the sinking boat? I think I did. And uh, other mishaps that, uh, well, yeah. But one thing I have discovered about going around the world and dealing with people from different cultures, well, first off, is that there's far more we have in common than we have to, that we, than our differences. And that's very relieving to see. Like when you're in Nam Che Bazaar, which is basically the last little village before ever space camp, and you see this woman come up, this old woman come up behind another old woman, and she puts her hands from behind over the woman's eyes and says whatever she says in Sherpa or Tibetan. But it's basically, guess who? And it's like, these things are common everywhere. That and the bird species. Can anyone guess what bird you can find anywhere? Any altitude? They are everywhere. And they always talk at the wrong time. <laughs> so for me, this is just my philosophy of recording, and I promise I won't spend too much time on it. We will get to talk about what the subject of the, record of the evening is. I promise. And there will be time for questions. Answer any question you have as truthfully and as completely as I can. And if I don't know, I'll just say I don't know. But what I want to talk about right now is integrity. And a lot of people think integrity is synonymous with honesty or being honorable or being forthright. And that's not true. And it's very important as a recording person or artist or however you choose to word it, that you're as aware of your weaknesses and what you need to work on that as you are of your strengths and that you commit to working through and you, you own you face up to yourself with all honesty to yourself about your shortcomings and own them and work on them. So the base word of integrity is to integrate, right? So to be a person of integrity means to integrate that which you would rather forget about yourself or downplay, along with the sort of stuff you would perhaps boast about or feel confident. And until you bring the two of them together, it's hard to be truly truthful and honest about the work you're doing, the people you'll interact with, everything. Because the way I view field recording is, in a way, truth gathering. We're gathering the sounds of nature or sometimes a mechanical device or a vehicle or what have you. But we want to capture the truth of the thing. And so truth is terribly important. And if you're lying to yourself, you're not doing anyone a service. Furthermore, when you're in a faraway land 
and you're having to communicate largely through pantomime, you know, you learn a few key phrases wherever you go, but you're, you're trying to get people to understand what you're trying to do to, like up in the Himalayas, people who have like headphones, what are those? I mean, you actually hear through those? And people can sense when you're full of it or when you're not. And so what I've learned in my travels, which is basically enough to go to the moon and back, is that it's very important to be honest. Now I'm a Minnesotan, so that's kind of drilled into you from the, from the get-go. It's part of the you know, so-called Protestant work ethic. But it's terribly important out there. If you, if you approach a situation, and I, I could name names, but that wouldn't be cricket. So if you approach a new situation, especially in the foreign land, but even here in Los Angeles, with humility and deference, you're going to get far more than if you barge in and say, well, I'm from, you know, Sky Deluxe Sound, and you owe me to let me go do what I want with your thing. That's going to get you nowhere fast. So these characteristics I'm talking about of being honest, and first and foremost, honest with yourself, and then humble and deferential, meek, dare I even say, will open doors, I promise. And if you're lucky, like when I first went in 1988 to the Langmuir Lightning Research Center in Socorro, New Mexico, I talked to a Doc Holmes, who's no longer with us. Doug Hemphill gave me his contact info and I called him up and I went there, and he and I met at the offices, which were down in Socorro. The lab was actually up on a mountaintop on a ridge. And he said, well, we're having kind of a dry summer, but you're welcome to go up and hang out with the boys. Meanwhile, the gardener, the meek and humble gardener, overheard the conversation. And I exit their offices and I go to the parking lot to meet my buddy who's got the pickup truck that's going to get us up there. And the gardener says, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? And I say, sure. And he says, you know, we never wanted to put the lab where it is. We really wanted to put it on Mount X. I'm not going to divulge the location quite yet. <laughs> and I mean, if you go to copyright.gov, you'll see my copyrights and the mountain is named. So, you know, if you do your due diligence, you'll know which one it is, but it's still a big mountain. And so I thought that was very interesting. And sure enough, we went to where the gardener sat. Because I'll tell you what, I will take the advice of the meek and humble over the intellectually proud any day. Furthermore, once I'm finally done with one more session up there to get more of the really, really close, the danger close, I plan on putting it all together and handing them a free copy along with a sharp rebuke. Stop sending recordists to your bogus location. Send them, have the humility to admit you settled for second best, and send them to the right place. They've been sending recordists for 30 years to the wrong mountain. The mountain I saw, following the gardener's advice, we got to one of the sub-peaks, maybe 750, 1,000 feet below the actual summit. Sort of, a, you know, like I said, a sub-peak. 
And if you were to draw a radius of 700 yards and encircle that sub-peak, every single tree, without exception, had the telltale single burn mark, usually down by the ground, and was dead. That's light not Only lightning does that. It's off. And so it became obvious that there's something about this mountaintop, you know, whether it be an ore deposit or who knows. But it was clearly, this is the place. So my buddy and I set up 150 yards below the line of doom. And uh, what I'd like to do now is play for you uh, what was recorded first. And you'll hear that it's, you know, it, it, it's a competent recording, but it lacks See, I always, I, I'm always, like I said, I'm looking for the truth of the thing. And if it isn't how I actually feel it in my body when I listen to it on headphones or monitors, I'm not happy. I'll keep adjusting. And so here is a short section of the very first recording setup, which was hung underneath a pine tree uh, up there on that mountaintop. As you can also maybe appreciate, uh, this is what the what it looks like in RX, and you can see all of this rain up here, right? I had to get rid of all of that. But this recording, I mean, it's a competent recording, you know, but but it, it's still unacceptable to me, and I could even tell this on headphones. This is back in 88, so the headphones weren't that great. And I was recording with Sheps, MK4s, uh, CMCH, Crave, and straight to DAP. So what I did, now I did not move the, I did not move the mics one inch north or one inch south east or west, and I will play for you what it sounds like, and you can, I think, hear the difference. Got a fuller bottom. No, th this is raw stuff. I'm not playing you finished product. Yes, sir. I, I can't without asking questions. The, the phasing is, uh, is it from the acoustic that's in the valley? From the Santa Ana Mountains? Uh, which phasing are you well, talking about? Because it's, there's, it's not really phasing. It's, it's the rain. Kind of, you know, it's the rain. The, that, that thunder does. There is, there are plenty of mountain acoustics. I didn't bring any of the real killers that have that. Just have to go to www.spiritsoundeffects.com. I can tweet the words. Buy it yourself and check it out. Hey. Uh, back to pick you up later. So, what do you think I did to get that more full sound? You know, in recorder. No, no post-production, no after-the-fact nonsense. Anyone care to hazard a guess? Maybe like some acoustic kind of baffling or something behind it? No. Nope. And you said you didn't change the position of the mic? I did not move the mic one inch north, south, east, or west. No, I moved it off axis. 
Nope. I lowered it. I put it at head height. I assumed right off the bat that it should be at tripod height, even though I was hanging it from a pine tree. And this was what finally won me over, in that the ground is a boundary layer, like a PZM. Use it. Now when I do nature stuff, I have no need for a mic stand. If I'm in the jungle, in Southeast Asia, I will take a very small camera tripod that I can split the lights out and make it very low. And I've got to tell you the difference between just the height. Charles and I are going to be doing some guns later this month. And I fully plan on, and guns is something I've, you know, got some experience recording. And I'm planning on at least starting, I'll have floor stands if I need to elevate them six inches off the ground. But I'm planning on starting by laying two 321s, I'm sorry, 421s, the old kind, not the Mark IIs, they stink. Um, laying them on the ground. Exactly. I, I also recorded fireworks in Bangkok uh, on, which I wish I could have borrowed an example of. Uh, a friend of mine owned a building right on the banks of the Chao Priya River. And you, if you see shots of the river, you'll see a kind of a pale green building with a Coca-Cola billboard on it. That's his building. So it was so awesome to go up to that billboard with two of these. My favorite mic. Now this isn't a budget mic, I'm afraid. But it is glorious. It's the Bach 195. And as they say, once you go Bach, you never go back. And I hung them about 40 feet apart, just right against the billboard. And wow. So the great, what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make is to get a great recording. I mean, heck, you can take this, 200 bucks, right here. Five microphones inside. Four channel at 48 kilohertz, two channel, 96. And you can get fantastic stuff. I mean, it needs a little EQ work and it needs denoising. I mean, it is a $200 device after all. But, I mean, I grew up with a Nagra, <coughs> first the 4.2 mono, and then the 4S. With all the batteries all the extra batteries and the tape and the frequent chiropractor visits because of it and all that stuff. We didn't have this variety of stuff. And now you have no excuse. And the best bang for the buck, in my personal opinion, is the Zoom H6. And on top here, I have the SSH-6, which is the MS Stereo short shotgun. And while it's not the quiet, quietest mic, it doesn't have the quietest mic pre's yeah, in the business. RX, RX makes a lot of going anyway. Exactly. But once you get your feet wet with RX, and you know to make two passes instead of one, <laughs> <laughs> And generally, in the second pass, I touched nothing below 750 hertz. I mean, this is all together what I'm holding in my hands here. This is 500 bucks. I mean, if this were available back in 1988, I would have been all over this. And this will do multi channel 96K, 24 bit. Six channels, four XLR. TRS ins on the side and the proprietary connection on top. I don't even bother with the NS and the XY mics that come with the package. 
I, I use this paint. And I'm happy with it. Is it as good as a Sennheiser 416? No. But it's stereo. And it gives a lot more signal than that old Neumann MS mic from back in the mid-80s. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember the model number. 191 IF. Thank you, Vic. I have some effects to play from that. It was very good for sticking into a five gallon glass, you know, the old fashioned glass type water bottle. It was Neumann fat. It was, it was fat, it was exactly. Fat. And I have some examples to play of that. But my favorite was the Sankin. Well, Sankin's noise floor was too high for me. <laughs> I, I had my Sheps MS, and yeah. when you compare the noise floor, it's just. Ben Burt was a big fan of the Sankin too, but. Back then, we didn't have noise reduction. So our choices were very, very limited. So I decided to stick to, for both convenience and being able to shape the width down the road however I wanted, I stuck with a pair of Sheps in an MS configuration, which meant one Zeppelin, not two. And it was a 416 Zeppelin that I could put my 416 into. And that 416 could take anything. But when we were recording on multiple uh, military bases for Air Force One, I mean, I lost count, truly. Uh, I was fortunate enough to see an F-18 in chocks in full afterburner state. I could count five plasma rings trailing behind me. I got as close as I could until it became physically painful. And I lowered my physical profile by kneeling. And I put the 416 on it. No problem. I mean, this was well over 120 dB. Well over. I mean, I could, I could feel it. I mean, it was... It was uncomfortable, but it caught me. So call me old school, but when you've got that, and then you've got the boutique mic, you've got the, now, I mean, I don't have a Chef's MS setup right now. Even when I did still have it, I would use the 195s, even if it meant a lot of sweat, like recording at Anchor Watt, for example. Uh, it, I mean, I was, Cambodia is incredible. I mean, not only do you have your, your barometer for human suffering completely reset, and you see all these children with limbs blown off, you know, begging and living in conditions that, you know, you have to see for yourself. But aside from that, uh, it was worth it to be so drenched in sweat the whole time. It was literally as though I had jumped in a lake. My clothes from head to toe were soaking wet. Every place we went, but it was worth it. So let's play some more fun, shall we? Let's go to, oh yeah, this is something I'm very, very happy with. Okay, here is the image. Now, what you're seeing, this is in a place called Khao Yai, which is known as one of the five best uh, national parks on the planet. And this is a park that actually has wild elephant, wild tiger, wild snakes of every kind. <laughs> and uh, I will get into the safety thing later about how to protect yourself against large mammalian predators as well as snakes. There are things you can do that actually work that don't cost a cent.
spelled S C E N T. So there's a little pun there. So as you can see here in this shot of the sonogram, the cicadas are just blisteringly loud. And I consider what happened in this recording to be providence. We, my, my wife of the time and I were spending a week in the jungle, didn't even take a tent. We just had our hammocks and we found trees that were spaced just right. And we strung up our hammocks in a line above to put the tarp on in case it came. And we had special A16 uh, mosquito nets to cover our heads when we're in the sleeping bags. And luckily, we went in with the North Face Himalayan bags because I'm here to tell you the jungle gets cold at night. <laughs> and it, it's very humid, so you, you really, the cold is, is, is palpable. So one morning, I get up and I kind of go off on my own. My wife is back at the camp, just kind of hanging out. And this is where I'd like to highlight that it's important to watch and be open to cues. And you never know where they're going to come from. You could pass a crazy homeless person on the street. And just as you're passing, he might be saying something. And it might, I mean, it's, it's incredible how often this happens to me. I'll hear something, and it'll give me an idea, and I'll go, aha. Now, here in the jungle, I didn't have any talking snakes or anything like that, but I did come across the strangest tree. Now, they used to study Egyptology when I was a kid, and I knew what my name, Peter, means rock. That right? comes from the Greek of Petrus. And in Egyptian, it's Ben. And it is written like this in hieroglyphs. That's it. And I found a tree, and it was about, I'd say, 10 feet. And it was a strong tree. It wasn't some kind of withered thing. So I string up my hammock. And I set, I have 50 feet of cable on the mics, so I set the mics down here. And I get up in the hammock, and I put the dad recorder in my lap, and I'm actually quite comfy. And so I... I with the hair. Yeah. Well, you know... Um, so, I, I took that as a cue. And so what you see here is something incredible. You see the cicadas being really obnoxious. And by that I mean like this. Okay? Now with isotope, you can work it to fix that. But it's as, though, it's as though there was a conductor over the whole thing. And the cicadas, as you can see, quiet down to quite a manageable level. And this gibbon comes up and parks himself about 40 feet in front of the mic and proceeds to give me his song for about 20 minutes. And the cicadas do not come back. The cicadas only come back when he's done. Just as though there was, this is a symphony and there was a great conductor making it happen. We'll go further in. This, this gibbon would make Ornette Coleman weep. Shuts him out. Low okay. 
How we go for the school? Yeah, and in 89, when I first went into the jungle, I did have a panicked moment. I mean, not panicked, I'm not wired for panic. But I, I had a moment of great concern, because just as you stated, when I turned the mics on, all I heard was the equivalent of shortwave radio hash. And uh, I thought I put it in here. But uh, perhaps I was mistaken. Anyway, what I did was, for some reason, I listened to... Oh, yes, another thing that the field recorders must have. Butane power, it's hovering iron. And yet, you know how to use it. So, what I had, luckily, the foresight, or I had an intuition, to bring with me the not silica flakes, those are pretty worthless, but I brought the photographic kind, the beads, the circular beads that are bonded with cobalt chloride. And so I go into our first aid kit and I take some gauze and I wrap it around two fingers and I sew one in shut. Because we have sewing stuff too. You have to be able to take care of everything when you're in the really remote. And I put in some of these blue beads, and I brought a lot. At first, I put in too much, and I couldn't quite fit them between the microphones the way I wanted, so I took a little bit out, and then sewed it shut. And if I pinched the middle, fit beautifully between the two ships, and I placed it behind the capsule, and learned that that will locally dehumidify inside the Zeppelin between four and eight hours. Wow. You're crazy in <laughs> And, well, again, intuition, folks. I'm gonna keep hammering away on intuition. Listen to your intuition. The intellect is highly overrated. It really, really is. Listening to your intuition and being a good person, an honest person, is far more important. And so I call this, and I don't mean to be offensive to any women here, but it does make sense. So please bear with me. I call it the microphone tampon. Because when it starts out, it's a bright, vibrant blue, and it proceeds to clear, to pink, to red. And when it's red, it's reached maximum absorbance. And so when it's red, you know it's time to change it. So, the name was born. Had you experimented with that before? Nope. <laughs> it was just a hunch. Again, listen to the intuition. I knew when I was getting ready for the trip, that might come in handy. Because yeah. I knew I was going to human places. I grew up in a human place. I did not I've, I've played that, I've danced that, to that tune. So, Later, my wife made out of mosquito netting a pouch of the same dimensions with a snap and a lid. Just a hanging, you know, it's almost it's just it's mosquito netting, thread, and one snap. And you just staple into place like with a little grommet handheld thing. And that worked. So I know people say, but yeah, the Sennheisers work at great in humidity, but you know what? They don't sound like chefs. And, you know, you just take, you just take, see, 
What are, what are a sound recordists, this is open to anybody who cares to answer, what are our two most important skills in your estimation? Listening. And then I'll give you my opinion. Listening, number one, very good. Anyone care to guess on number two? Your own yes. Problem Real close. Get all, you know what? I'll give it to you. Resourcefulness. Because you're, there's no way to plan ahead for what's going to happen. You never know. And you know what? Mr. Murphy is always along for the ride. <laughs> hence, hence, having your soldering iron. So how many people in this room consider themselves field recordists? Okay, please keep your hand up if you can solder and solder well. Oh, we have fewer field recordists. Because if you can't fix it when you're in the middle of nowhere, you're no longer a recordist. You're the nurser of a dead machine. Or recording in mono. So, things happen, and you have to be able to flow with it. And sometimes really nasty things happen. And my friend Jerome, who I took was the smartest thing I ever did, I took along, I, I remember going back to Minnesota, and the guy who was going to go with me originally backed out at the last minute. And so I looked over to Jerome and I said, if I pay you five grand and pay your way, will you take a six month trip around the world with me? Didn't even blink. He said, absolutely. Smartest move I ever made. Man, going it alone would have been not so smart. And we're in Egypt, again in this village. It seems like all this pain centered around this village called Abu Sir, which now is a suburb of Cairo. It's no longer a two donkey town. You know, but back in 89, it was a two-donkey town with one motor, a four-horsepower four pump that they used between fields for irrigation. That was it for, for technology. So one morning, and, and the reason I sounded uh, on that very first thing I played, I, my, my speech was a little slurred because I had come down with tonsillitis in Thailand before that. So I was running 104 fever at the time. But too bad. It was still up every morning at 3.30, no matter what. So luckily I have my inner drill sergeant, and he makes a guy in full metal jacket look like a wimp. Because he's like, oh, you're sick? Too bad. Get up. And so, so we get up. It's about... 3.34 in the morning, and we're walking across the graveyard. We are, we'd lost our mini mags by this point. Of course, the Egyptian flashlights we bought worked for maybe 10 minutes, and then they no longer worked. So it's a moonless night, only starlight, and we're just bumping into everything on the way to get to this bluff overlooking the village so I can record the transition from night to morning. That was the objective. And we're cobbling along, and I didn't hear them approach, which is incredible, because normally I'm, I'm pretty good about that. Situational awareness, situational awareness is a very important thing to cultivate and employ when you are working anywhere in the field, really. You really need to learn how to use your peripheral vision and listen to the intuition, not so much the intellect. You know, the discursive thought is too distracting. And we're, we're hobbling along, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, each of us has a very bright flashlight 
shining in our face, we're being yelled at in Arabic, and each of us has a Colt 1911 45 caliber handgun to our head, to our temple. Okay? Now, I'm fortunate because my amygdala is not wired for flight, nor is it wired for fight. It's just wired to stand my ground. And so my hands are up, and the debt bag is down here on my right side, and the single Zeppelin with the dead cat on it is sticking out. And I just pivot my left hand down, and I point and look and say, Hollywood. <laughs> they got it. They put away their sidearms, took us up to their hut. They were actually watchmen looking out for tomb raiders. Because in that part of Egypt, that's a very real thing. This was the nearest town to the ruins of Saqqara, if you know about that. And there are tombs being discovered up there all the time. So tomb robbers are a very real thing, and this was their job. So they took us to their hut, which could easily have come out of the first century BC. And they made tea for us. So I set up the recording rig about 200 yards away, comfortably far enough to not pick up muffled conversation, and just let it rip with a two hour day. So they made tea in the Sahara for us as the sun rise, as the sun rose. And it turned out they were the only two Egyptians we had close interaction with that did not ask for bakshish. Moral of the story is, someone may have a gun to your head one minute, but if you play your cards right, they could be your next buddy. And I'm here to tell you it's true. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood, that's another story. But, um, and maybe we don't have time for that. So, uh, what I'd like to do is because there's uh, a point I really want to make that I think is very, very important. And it involves playing a couple of scenes from the movie What Dreams May Come. They might think, what does this have to do with field recording? I'd say everything. So, the first scene I'm going to play for you, I would ask for you to listen for the sound that most disturbs you. Apologize for every time I shot that one. We're in the wrong order here. Oh no, it's my, my silly mistake. I said I love you, Bella. I always remember that. For what disturbs you on a primal level?
what? High frequency screeches. Baby cry. Uh, you see, there are two kinds of disturbances. We have the relatively disturbing and the generally disturbing. And Steven Spielberg is a complete whore when it comes to this. For example, let's say you're showing a photography exhibit, exhibit in Omaha, Nebraska. Right, Pete. Oh. The relatively disturbing versus the generally disturbing. Steven Spielberg is, he uses this in every single film, without fail. Let's say you have a photo exhibit in Omaha, Nebraska, and you put up, someone, the photographer decides to put up a photo of cow entrails hammered against the wall. Now, some people might find that disturbing. But just what happens in Nebraska, you've got a lot of people who work in the meatpacking business. To them, that's just part of work. That's just part of life. We're kind of removed from that. We get our stuff shrink-wrapped. But when it comes to, bless you, when it comes to children in distress, everybody gets it on a gut level. And Spielberg if you think the Schindler's List with the one bit of color used in the entire film, just to make sure you didn't miss it, he put that pink jacket on the little girl. If you want to engage your audience, put kids in danger. And there you go. You got them. So, recording, get those babies crying and use them. <laughs> because they speak to people on a subconscious, deep heart level. Well, I don't know if it's so subconscious. Well, yeah, well, it's on a heart level. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. Got it. Yeah, it, it really hits people. So here I've got another one, and this is about using very simple recordings, and very sparingly, to get your point across. I recorded my assistant, Carrie Carmine, who went on to become a notable sound designer in her own right, because she sounded a lot like Annabella Sciorra, who was the female lead, who ends up committing suicide and going to hell. And it's, it's a redemption story. So here we have Carrie blending with Annabella, and hopefully seamlessly because it's too late to change it. <laughs> it's completely new. The canvas was blank when I was alive. How can I see this drawing after I'm dead? <laughs> For an expert, you look pretty surprised. And the given crime is in here. You and Annie are long court you? No, actually. From the very first moment, it was like... Soulmate. It's extremely rare, but it exists. Sort of like twin souls tuned into each other. Apparently even in death. You're reaching each other through a painting. It's, it's nothing I've ever seen, Chris. You can't see it, can you? And you never will.
That was simplicity itself. It was just taking, you know, Carrie in my room, turning the lights down, putting the 416 right in front of her. It could have been any mic. It could have been even the cheap stuff here. And just gently coaching her through various tragic thoughts, pictures, feelings, getting that down, and then just doing the preverb thing by reversing it, adding reverb flipping back. And then when we get to hell, we get maybe the only original sound effect I've ever made, and that is what I call my side eyes, where again it was flip it, add reverb to the head, flip it again so it's preverb now, add reverb to the tail, then Doppler the whole thing for the large space to talk to to address her suffering because that's what the scene is about. And I would like to call attention to Branford Marcellus, who had, uh, I saw a brilliant documentary, and I respect him as a musician a great deal. And he was on the phone with an interviewer, and the interviewer was being really sycophantic, saying, man, you know, you could hear both sides of the conversation even though the camera was just on Branford. And the guy was just lavishing praise. And Branford was just sitting there, you know, dead face. And the guy was done. He was like, I don't know how you did that with Bird Song Man, but you made it into something completely new. And Branford finally had enough, and he said, that's bull crap. The song tells me what's available. It's not me. The song tells me what's available. Guys, that's the trick. Whether it's a scene or a location, it tells you what's available. And it's up to you, who got the second question right, you're the first person to ever do that. Kudos. It's up to you to make that live, to make it real. When Peter Brown and I went up to the top of the very tippy top of the mountain, and we, it didn't look like it did it, it, back in 88, and it turns out it's because we took the wrong road. <laughs> And I saw that the grade going down from the top of the mountain was pretty steep. And I was thinking, all right, what am I going to do about this? I mean, it's too steep to put a floor stand on. So this is why you never travel without your block. This, meet my best field friend. This is the Glock Infantry Shovel. And it's worth its weight in gold. And aside from being a shovel, aside from being a shovel, it is also, which is really handy if you need to, like, if you haven't done the rain diffusion thing first, like a smart person. You've got yourself a saw. And this whole thing probably weighs, I don't know, three pounds, if that. And as you can see, it's quite beat up, but it's still sharp on the blade. And it has saved my butt so many times. So I knew that to make the best of the steep grade, what I could do is cut horizontally in and dig out little coves to set the mics in. And then for the rain, and this is where we give a tip of the hat to Martin Lopez, if any of you know him, you take this, believe it or not, is a fully collapsed, I call it the rain igloo. And this is a dome. 
You can bend chicken wire into any shape you want. And I, what I'm holding here in my hands is very light, and it's about 75 cents, if that. Probably more like 50. And then we have nylon batting, one inch thing. And you circle the igloo with two inches, so twice around. No rain is going to hit the mics. And if it's too splocky on the ground near you, you go with plenty and you lay it around in a skirt. You don't hear it. It's gone. Very lightweight. Total bill of materials, buck fifty. Now, when you buy this in bulk, it's going to, you know, it's a buck a foot for a ten foot wide section. So, it's a bargain. And then you've got your contact mics. I have it in my mind to, with the close lightning, to put these into trees so that I would get that kind of piano resonance from the trees reacting with the lightning. The thunder when I was up last summer wasn't close enough. But I did get some really awesome tree beetle munching. But see this nitric connector? You can buy 20 of these pickups for half the cost of this connector. 20 of them. Pre-wired on, on the pickup end. So all you have to do is solder the three in the XLR. Seven bucks for 20. So now we will go to hell. found her. Impressive. That jolt of fear for her, it connected. My God, is that our house? Suicides can get pretty tortured, pretty committed to punishing themselves. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. So, going back to what I was saying earlier, the scene was about, I mean, we're now in her version of hell. So, what am I going to put in the environment? Pig screams? Screaming eels? No. I'm going to put her suffering moving front to back, side to side, back to front. Just her suffering is floating in the air. And it's just as simple as a woman's sigh that happens to sound pretty darn close to Annabella, to our main character. So that is an example to me of 
I mean, again, if you, if you listen carefully, it's just one thing at a time. It's extremely simple and recorded very deliberately with intent and then placed in the scene with intent. To serve the narrative by listening to the scene in a very deep, heartfelt way so that you can sense what's available to you in any given scene. I apologize for every time I failed you, especially this one. forgive themselves. on that one because that darkening effect the that was just simple dry ice cue and I just took my entire forearm and just boom all at once on the sampler keyboard and that means of course the lower pitched ones will end the thing so I wanted it to be felt more than heard the director really liked it and so he cranked it up I, for one, like my stuff played quietly. And as you could hear in that, there was, as far as sound, it was kind of scary in a way because everything is exposed. There's nothing that's buried by a Hans Zimmer score or by thick backgrounds. It's like everything is playing one thing at a time, pretty much exposed. And that can be nerve-wracking. 
So I had more to play, but this has taken more time, and so I would be remiss if I didn't open the floor to questions, and I'll do my best to answer. Yes, sir. Um, so when you're, uh, are you coming up with these ideas uh, in the script writing phase? Do you, do you get handed a script and then you start brainstorming sonic textures and, and approaches, or do you wait for the scene? Walter Murch said something in a lecture that was very, very pertinent. And he said that if the sound is written into the script, you have a chance. If it isn't, you don't. And he was right. And I wait until I see the director's cut. And then I, again, I call it deep listening, because I'm not just listening with my intellect. I'm not just listening with, I'm listening with my heart, my intuition, the gut, whatever you want to call it, my spirit. I'm listening to it on all these levels. And if you think the heart has nothing to do with the mind, science is getting close to making the connection. And the time has had it right for the last 2,000 years. I speak time. And it's like almost every other word is jai. Jai is heart in time. Everything is jai is jai that, jai, 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 jai. There are thousands of phrases that contain the word jai. Go to a Thai restaurant and listen to how many times you hear Jai. It's insane. So I remember reading this report of a woman who got a heart transplant from this man who died. And in the ICU, the first thing she says on coming to is, I want a beer. <laughs> and then she checked herself and went, but I don't drink. What's going on? Well, she only learned after being released from the hospital, when she did her due diligence to express gratitude to the family of the donor of the heart that's now beating in her chest, she learned that he was a very big lover of beer. So just because science can't yet... See, I'm a physics guy, and the great thing I understand about science it doesn't conflict with theology or matters of metaphysics, is science is always on a path of learning. There is no last word in science unless you're talking about the laws of thermodynamics. That, those are pretty hard and fast. But the connection between the heart and the mind, I didn't say brain, I said mind, exists, and you need to exploit that. You need to be sensitive to that. I mean, you know when you're in the presence with someone who's got a big heart. You can feel it, right? Well, develop that if you're not already there. Yes, sir? It's pretty rare that you get the opportunity to look at it, get it from the front end. We're usually serving Of course, and I have no problem with that, because one thing we have to remember, okay, I'm going to start with this statement. If you got into sound for personal glory, you really screwed up, okay? We are secondary artists. We exist to support someone else's vision. There's one director that I worked with in Thailand. He's a British man, lovely guy. And he actually wants to make a movie that starts with the soundtrack first. We'll see if that ever happens. But otherwise, we serve someone else's vision. And it's important to remember that. You've got lots of sound designers out there who like to make things cool and make them go back in the surrounds and, you know, but it's kind of like this and the thing is, you know what I'm talking about, I think. And that's not where it's at. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about that. Not 
the Mac desktop. I mean, the, you know, <laughs> the stuff inside the proscenium. And the guy who's directing it and what their vision is. And with what dreams may come, when I was given the rough cut, it was incredible. It was like the best design opportunity I had ever seen beyond a Star Wars film. Unfortunately, it got pummeled into a Hallmark card by a collection of nine producers. What I saw at first was insanely brilliant, and it got neutered. Any other questions? Yes, Frank. Have you ever uh, found yourself working on a film that's maybe related to what you just said? A film where you all of a sudden realize that the people who made the film didn't really understand what it was about? No, I don't think I've encountered that. I mean, these people, you know, the people who make films, they're living it for five years, generally. Maybe three if they're doing a rush job. They're pretty, no, in my experience, these people know it backwards and forwards. They have, now, I have encountered directors who have a terrible time communi communicating what it is they want. I mean, we've all heard the, can you make it more green or purple? Yeah. You know? There, there is that. But then you have to try and explore that. You know, do you mean it should be brighter? Or do you want it to be softer? So you don't roll your eyes and go, that's, you know, sound doesn't have color. Well, yes, it does. And it's up to you to get into their head and support them. We are secondary artists. Our job is to support the primary artist. And if you're not happy with that, find another line of work. Yes, sir, you had a question back there. Probably the last one, because the staff is getting kind of. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I wondered if you could talk about your equipment a little bit. And for those of us on a very small budget with our kit, what you recommend the most? You talked about the H6, and also I think it was the um, Zoom short shotgun. Yep. That's your ideal budget? Absolutely, without a doubt. That is the best $500 spent. I've, I have a close relationship with Samuel Green because I was part of bringing this into being, the Zoom F6 floating point field recorder. It's the pre-production model. And um, I told him that 149 for that mic is, is ridiculous. People would pay twice that. But Zoom keeps it low. I mean, Zoom, I wish Zoom had come along 20 years earlier. Because they have really changed the game. And they are so dedicated to making their mic priest quieter, to being the first manufacturer of a recorder on earth to make a floating point recorder, which is a very big deal. Does everybody here understand floating point? I'm not talking about headroom. Well, floating point is exactly what it says, right? You've got your, you've got your digits. There's a lot of digits, so I'm not going to draw them all out. But on a standard in a linear, this is your meter, okay? Down here is nothing. Up here is loud. We call it zero or 24 bit. Here is 12 bit. Here is six. Here's three. Here's 18. Here's 15, here's 21. This is quiet, right? So when you're doing something soft, say it's 4-bit right in here, 4-bit gives you approximately 429 zeros and ones to describe that moment. That's how big the word is, okay? When something is loud, you get to the order of 
four and a half million. Zeros and ones to describe it. But you gotta be all the way up here. I mean, if you want a really brutal view, I just so happen to have a brutal view. And it is from a wonderful website I can't recommend highly enough called Filmmaker IQ. And he's talking in terms of image making, but the principles are exactly the same. It's digital storage. So the top stop would be the top 3 dB. That's half your storage in linear. That's insane. That means if you aren't 3 dB from the top from flipping, if you aren't riding that danger zone, you're getting, in the case of 24-bit, 12-bit or lower. Floating point changes the game. Floating point does just what it says. The decimal point floats. Okay? The, the, the point can move. It's no longer fixed. So if all the actions happening down here or alternating between loud and soft, the bits redistribute themselves down here. And then if something loud happens, it's reading just ahead enough to do it, it then redistributes things back to their starting point. But if they're not doing anything, they come down here. So instead of having 430 zeros and ones to describe our four bit signal, we now have, I checked this today, and I could swear in the past it was a bigger number, but we have at least 4.23 billion zeros and ones describing that moment as opposed to 428. That's a big difference. Your floating point math coprocessors have been in silicon for the past 20 years. My phone can record 32-bit floating point. It's not a big deal. Math code processors are there to do it. So your signal to noise ratio is much, much better than the point. No, because sig noise is induced mechanically. Okay. So noise is still an issue. So isotope, their future is secure. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, when you're, you have, with this floating point required, you're recording the lower sounds, the, the very low amplitude sounds, but you're capturing much more detail in them. Precisely. Okay. Which means like for winds, which, you know, barely tickle the meter sometimes, mm -hmm. so you're dealing with 4-bit. To give you a frame of reference, those of you who can remember the 70s, the video game Pong, that was 8-bit. Okay? So we're talking worse than Pong. And is this at market right now? And how or how much? It'll be at market it first week of June. And how much we is think. it going to uh, list for? One hundred and fifty dollars more than an H six. Okay. No, I'm sorry. It's going to be uh, the the F six is going for six fifty, oh, wow. six forty nine. Wow. But how many channels? How many? Uh, six. 96 32 bit floating point. Really? Wow. If you want to go to 192, then you do have to go to 24. There are limitations to what you can do at this price point. But 96K will take care of most things. I'd like to point something out to you. And this is not a BS question. What do a hummingbird and, a, and an elephant have in common? Mm -mm. All right, the hummingbird lives for three to five years. Elephant basically has a human lifespan. During their lifespan, they have roughly the same number of heartbeats. Let that be an object lesson to you about high frequencies. Okay? Because every time a sine wave goes through a full cycle, that's one unit of energy. 
And if it's a high frequency sound, it's going to go through four units of energy in what would have taken for a lower frequency sound to go through one. So high frequency fall off is real. The reason I'm bringing that up is because there are people who are just far too tunnel vision on recording at 192 kilohertz. Now there are things that do reach around 55 kilohertz. So 96 is still damn close to being able to capture that. But you've got to be really, really close. Because in the real world, like the hummingbird and the elephant, high frequencies just don't last. They, they take up their energy faster. So they fall off faster. You can't get around this. That's law of physics. I want to ask you one question about that mic. Is it an MS mic? Yes, it is. Is it only MS, or does it have a... You, you can go mono if you like. Correct. Okay. Well, mono. Right. But it's better than you think. Oh, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, and it gives you more gain than the old noise. You're talking about that Zoom short shot then? Correct. Is there any other model number for it? Or it's just SSH6. You can find these used on eBay, and I would have no hesitation to buy them used on eBay for stupid low prices. And so if you're on a budget, that's the first stop. The second stop would be the H2N. Now if you do a search for H2N ambisonics, you're going to find all kinds of geeks out there that have made decoding plugins for Recording with the zoom in four channel mode, where with the front you're recording MS and with the rear you're recording ORTF or XY. And they've made decoders to give you a full ambisonic spread. Oh, really? Yes. There's a, there's a whole community out there for doing that. For that one device, oddly enough, Zoom isn't providing diddly, but there are plenty of people who are. That's pretty slick. Zoom, mm -hmm. has, zoom has a VR recorder out. They do, but it's it's one unit, yeah. so you can't put the mic somewhere else and then be comfortably far away so you can breathe. Right. They do have a Bluetooth thing. They do have a Bluetooth thing, but, you know, riding a virtual fader isn't the same. No. Um, I'd like to ask you if uh, you were to teach uh, a number of students that have never heard about of sound before in their lives, and uh, you, would, you had to explain what you do and why it's important for the filmmaking process, what would you say? We support the story on a subtle, if not subconscious level. Now, everybody talks about <coughs> music. Mm -hmm. You know, the argument used to be, and Doug Hemphill had a great response for this, you don't hear kids walking out of the theater humming sound effects. Doug's response was, really? You ever, you ever seen Star Wars? you got plenty of kids coming out going, pew, pew. <laughs> right? Furthermore, to address the subconscious thing, and I'll make this quick, um, if you, whenever our good guys are blasting off in the Falcon, it's always in a hurry in there. Again, they're trying to get away from the bad guys, and it's, it's got a, the ship has to project power. So what animal in the wild would make you undeniably think of strength, mastery, kingship? Bingo. It's nothing but a perfectly looped lion's horn. Meanwhile, okay, so your conscious mind is watching the visual. It's caught up with the plot. It's listening to this dialogue, it's, it's, it's occupied. The subconscious mind can handle many orders of magnitude more information. And your subconscious mind is going to hear that lion and react. It's programmed into you. That's Ben Burt's genius. He knows deeply 
how, like when in Return of the Jedi, Luke defeats the Rancor by making the door come down on his head. And the jailer, the keeper of that monster, starts crying. And Ben wanted to make, or as he told me, he wanted to make the audience feel a sense of pathos with the creature. So if you watch the film, there's no pitch shifting, no reverb, nothing. When that creature, the rancor, does its death sign, it's just his pet collie whining for food. <laughs> Which plays at your heartstrings. That's it. You watch the movie and you'll go, wait a minute, that's just a dog whine. That's not a monster. There you go. I think we've, um, we're overstaying our welcome. I'd like to thank you all for coming. And to stop. And we didn't hope to have it the last, but uh, that's just kind of how it goes. I had some wonderful helicopter stuff to play for you, but maybe next time. All right. Have a good night and drive safe. <laughs>